English enclosures and Soviet collectivization. Two instances of an anti-peasant mode of development. Joseph R. Stromberg, 1995. 1. Introduction. Land Monopoly as an Historical Perennial. The control of major material and human factors of production by small articulated minorities has been characteristic of civilized state societies. Of the four factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability, it is probably the control of land that has been of the greatest historical consequence, especially for pre-industrial societies. In the West, land monopoly has been intimately associated with feudalism in a political-economic sense. Footnote. In Europe, Germanic conquest of the Roman Empire's western provinces set the stage for feudalism in both the political, military, and economic meanings of the term. Certain features of this original feudalism persisted in two succeeding social formations. See Alexander Rousteau, Freedom and Domination, Princeton, New Jersey, Princeton University Press, 1980, and Arno Mayer, The Persistence of the Old Regime, New York, Pantheon, 1981. Critics as far apart ideologically as Karl Marx and the liberal Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises have stressed the role of force, politics, and extra-economic coercion in the creation of large landed estates. In Marx's words, In actual history, it is notorious that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, briefly, force, play the great part. Footnote. Karl Marx, Capital, New York International, 1967. 1. Page 714. Marx was referring, of course, to primitive accumulation of capital, but his words have application to other forms of property. And Mises. Nowhere and at no time has the large-scale ownership of land come into being through the workings of economic forces in the market. It is the result of military and political effort. Founded by violence, it has been upheld by violence, and that alone. As soon as the latifundia are drawn into the sphere of market transactions, they begin to crumble, until at last they disappear completely. Footnote. Ludwig von Mises, Socialism, an Economic and Sociological Analysis. London, Jonathan Cape, 1951, page 375. With the growth of urban economies in Western Europe, the revival of Mediterranean trade during the Renaissance, and the development of modern banking and credit mechanisms, despite the inherited religious doctrine condemning usury, market relations penetrated the countryside, gradually undermining and transforming the senescent order of feudalism. This process, whose eloquent heralds include Marx, Max Weber, Barrington Moore Jr., and Emanuel Wallerstein, made for a hybrid transitional society in which pre-capitalist and capitalist attitudes and institutions uneasily coexisted. Footnote. See Max Weber, Capitalism and Rural Society in Germany, from Max Weber, Essays in Sociology, edited by Hans Gerth and C. Wright Mills, New York, OUP, 1958, pages 363 to 385, Barrington Moore, Jr., Social Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, Boston, Beacon, 1966, Emanuel Wallerstein, The Modern World System, New York, Academic, 1974. Lost in the historical shuffle was small commodity production, a possible mode of production in its own right and an alternative to both feudalism and capitalism. Only recently have Marxist scholars paid serious attention to this topic. Footnote. See Robert Brenner, The Origins of Capitalist Development, A Critique of Neo-Smithian Marxism. New Left Review, July to August 1977, especially pages 88 to 90. Claudio Katz, Karl Marx on the Transition from Feudalism to Capitalism, Theory and Society 22, June 1993, pages 363 to 389. Arthur de Quattro, The Labor Theory of Value and Simple Commodity Production, Science and Society, 71, October 2007, pages 455 to 483. In these circumstances, the land question loomed large. Its resolution, one way or another, threatened some sections of society as much as it boded well for others. Some writers, not as sanguine as Mises concerning the tendency of market relations to dissolve large holdings of land, emphasized the persistence of political forces and economic positions stemming from the feudal past into modern times. 
for Franz Oppenheimer, Alexander Rousteau, Wilhelm Rolpke, J.S. Mill, Joseph Schumpeter, Arno Mayer, and others, remnants of the past significantly conditioned early capitalism, bringing about political economies in the West that fell rather short of the ideal market economy of classical liberal theory and aspirations. Footnote. See Franz Oppenheimer, The State, New York, Free Life, 1975-1914. Wilhelm Rolpke, The Social Crisis of Our Time, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1950. Joseph Schumpeter, Imperialism and Social Classes, New York, Meridian, 1955. Rousteau, Mayer. A few quotations must suffice. The near-anarchist liberal poet Shelley wrote that large-scale property has its foundation in usurpation or imposture or violence, without which, by the nature of things, immense possessions of gold or land could never have been accumulated. Of this nature is the principal part of the property enjoyed by the aristocracy and the great fundholders, the great majority of whose ancestors never deserved it by their skill and talents, or acquired or created it by their personal labor. Footnote. Percy Bishy Shelley. Political Writings. Edited by Roland Duckerson. New York, Appleton, 1970, page 140. Despite the relatively early rise of commercial relations in England, John Stuart Mill could write that the principle of private property has never yet had a fair trial in any country, and less so, perhaps, in this country than in some others. And, notwithstanding what industry has been doing for many centuries to modify the work of force, the system still retains many and large traces of its origin. Footnote. John Stuart Mill Principles of Political Economy, London, Longmans, 1909, 1891, page 208. More recently, writing of the primal distribution of property, rather than Marx's primitive accumulation, Franz Oppenheimer said, Rising capitalism inherited from its predecessor, feudal absolutism. Capitalism took over all of feudalism's basic institutions, especially two, the privileges of state administration, and the monopoly of land. Footnote. Franz Oppenheimer, A Critique of Political Economy 2, A Postmortem on Cambridge Economics. American Journal of Economics and Sociology 2, July 1943, page 535. In a world increasingly unified by merchant capital, Western imperialism, and, a bit more tardily, industry, the land question has persisted right up to the present. Footnote. Land is at the center of the problems in the Middle East. See Stephen Holbrook, The Alienation of a Homeland, How Palestine Became Israel. Journal of Libertarian Studies 5, Fall 1981, pages 357 to 374. Whether or not they have followed the liberal democratic road, the Prussian road of revolution from above, or the road of mass-based peasant revolutions led and typically betrayed by Marxist revolutionaries, countries the world over have had to address the problem of modernizing agrarian relations. Footnote, the three roads to modernization came from more social origins. In case after case, the access of ordinary people to land and markets has been controlled ultimately by the constellation of political forces. It seems safe to say that the issue has seldom been settled in the interest of peasantries. The level of popular discontent and land hunger is perhaps summarized best in the vast emigrations from the British Isles and Western Europe to various parts of what Walter Prescott Webb called the Great Frontier. Just as the moving land frontier functioned in some sense as a safety valve for discontent in the eastern states of the United States, so North America, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa functioned on a grander scale as a safety valve for European society generally. Footnote, Walter Prescott Webb, The Great Frontier, Boston, Hewton, 1952. On emigration from Britain spurred by enclosure, specifically from Scotland and northern England, see Bernard Balin, Voyagers to the West, New York, Knopf, 1987, pages 43 to 49, 291, 375 to 376, and 606 to 608. The English enclosures, standing as they do as a centerpiece in the ongoing optimist-pessimist debate over the Industrial Revolution, will be the first instance of agrarian collectivization or consolidation discussed in these pages.
A brief aside on Latin American latifundismo will precede the treatment of another significant model of agrarian change, Soviet collectivization, as a bureaucratic enclosure movement. The comparison of the English enclosures with Soviet collectivization should yield interesting insights into how, or how not, to reform an agrarian sector. To anticipate a bit, it may be that neither collectivization for a commercially active minority, the English example, nor enclosures directed by bureaucracy, the Soviet example, with its disturbing resemblances to something like an Asiatic mode of production, provide an ideal path to modernization, at least if peasant interests and aspirations are given any weight as against competing goals, such as rate of growth or the retention of power by political elites. Footnote. An analysis of communist states as atavistic phenomena is presented in Carl A. Wittfogel, Oriental Despotism, New York, Vintage, 1981-1957. But see Perry Anderson, Lineages of the Absolute State, London, Verso, 1979, pages 462-549, to The Asiatic Mode of Production. The English Enclosures and a Rural Reserve Army the debate among historians over the enclosure resolves itself into approximately the same optimist and pessimist camps that continue to argue the costs and benefits of industrialization in late 18th and early 19th century England. In rough summary, the optimists tend to see enclosure, as it actually took place, as essential to the introduction of technical improvements, new crop rotations, and more effective economic organization of the English countryside. This made it possible more effectively to feed England's growing population, a part of which would subsequently be available as wage laborers in incipient industries. The optimists tend to accept the fairness of the commissions on enclosure and would minimize the dislocations occurring as marginal peasants were moved off the land over the course of several centuries. Footnote, Jonathan D. Chambers and Gordon E. Mingay Enclosures Not Guilty, in Philip A. M. Taylor, Editor, The Industrial Revolution in Britain, Triumph or Disaster, Lexington, Massachusetts, Heath, 1970, page 53. The very slowness and complexity of the enclosure movement suggest that the optimist case can be proven, on its own terms, in some narrow selection of cases, but since those terms tend to rule out the most interesting problems, the jury is still out and a whole new literature challenging the optimists has arisen in the decades since the latter declared victory. Footnote, CN64, Infra. For T.S. Ashton, the essential point about enclosure is that it brought about an increase in the productivity of the soil. For Jonathan Chambers and Gordon Mingay, enclosure shows how large gains in economic efficiency and output could be achieved by reorganization of existing resources. David Landis merely remarks that the improving landlords were a powerful leaven. Sir John Clapham remains content to describe the details of enclosure, making no judgment at all. Footnote. D. S. Ashton, The Industrial Revolution, 1760-1830. London, OUP, 1948, 26. Chambers and Mingay, Enclosures. 63. David S. Landis, The Unbound Prometheus, Technological Change and Industrial Development in Western Europe from 1750 to the Present, Cambridge, UK, CUP, 1969-69, and John Clapham, A Concise Economic History of Britain, Cambridge, UK, CUP, 1949, pages 194 to 207, 222 to 224. And the optimist viewpoint is strongly advanced by the writings of Robert Hartwell. Footnote. See R. M. Hartwell, History and Ideology, Studies in History and Philosophy 3, Menlo Park, California, IHS, no date. The South German free market economist Wilhelm Rock, whose economic views reflected a strain of conservative Protestantism, has remarked that the debate over industrialization has been between anti-capitalist intellectuals and anti-intellectual capitalists. For Ropke, the collection of essays edited by F. A. von Hayek, Capitalism and the Historians, has done little to improve the discussion. Footnote, Wilhelm Ropke, A Humane Economy, the Social Framework of the Free Market, 
Indianapolis, Indiana, Liberty Fund, 1971, pages 227 to 278. Friedrich Hayek, editor, Capitalism and the Historians, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1954. The pessimist view originated with Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, and other contemporary critics of early industrialization, and continues in the work of J. L. and Barbara Hammond, Maurice Dobb, Eric Hobsbawm, and E. P. Thompson. For the pessimists, whose overlap with Marxist economic historians is evident from this partial list, enclosure represents outright expropriation of the main body of English peasants by those who possessed the political power to engross the land. While they conceded, too soon it now appears, the long-range increase in food supply and strictly economic efficiency, the pessimists stress that enclosure was an unmitigated social and economic disaster for the immediate generations of peasants dispossessed. The difference between economic improvement qua system and social disaster for the small and middling peasants is particularly well put by Pauline Gregg. Footnote, Pauline Gregg, Modern Britain, a Social and Economic History Since 1760. New York, Pegasus, 1965, Chapter 1. The nature and course of the enclosures are complex matters indeed. Some of the best accounts of the process are found in the writings of those whom we might call semi-pessimists, such as Paul Mantu, Barrington Moore Jr., Theta Skokpol, and Pauline Gregg, reaching back perhaps to Thorold Rogers. Footnote See Paul Mantu, The Industrial Revolution in the Eighteenth Century, New York, Harper, 1961, 1928, Chapter 3, The Redistribution of Land. More, Chapter 1, England and the Contribution of Violence to Gradualism. Theta Skokpol, States and Social Revolutions, New York, CUP, 1979, pages 140 to 144, and Gregg, pages 19 to 35. To begin with, one must distinguish between the areas under cultivation as open fields, or narrow strips of land randomly interspersed, such that strips 1, 5, and 9 might belong to one peasant, 2, 6, and 13 to another, and so on, and the wastes, areas on the margin of cultivation where customary rights to pasture, collection of firewood, and other benefits had developed over time. In addition to the open fields and the wastes, large areas of land were given over to commercial agriculture and stock raising by landlords or their large-scale tenant farmers, especially in South and Central England. The situation in the North and in Scotland was somewhat different, but far too complex to deal with here. Footnote. For Scottish developments, see Eric J. Hobsbawm, Scottish Reformers of the Eighteenth Century and Capitalist Agriculture. Peasants in History, edited by Hobswam et al., Delhi, OUP, 1980, pages 3 to 29. Tom Devine, The Highland Clearances, Refresh, 4, Spring, 1987, pages 5 to 8. And Neil Davidson, The Scottish Path to Capitalist Agriculture 2, The Capitalist Offensive, 1749 to 1851. Journal of Agrarian Change, 4. October 2004, pages 411 to 460. Besides the complexities of everyday cultivation, the system was crisscrossed by several different degrees of ownership and tenancy, ranging from fee, simple ownership, and long-term leases, through copyhold, down to merely customary tenancies at the will of the landlord. In the course of enclosure, it was precisely those cultivators with modest claims and the weakest legal rights to land who fell by the wayside, becoming part of a rural proletariat. Since the term enclosure applies to any consolidation of open fields or waste into larger, more rational units of production, another point we will return to, and since such consolidations date from Tudor times to the late 18th and early 19th centuries, an especially brisk period, the notion is stretched almost to the breaking point. A great many authorities had to spend a great deal of time and effort to bring order and coherence to the history of the enclosures. Footnote. Two of the clearest short accounts are by Clapham and Gregg. Whatever the merits of the argument that bigger units of production are ipso facto more efficient and productive, the political dominance of large landowners determined the course of enclosure. 
While improving landlords may have believed the arguments put forward by agricultural reformers and enthusiasts like Jethro Tull and Arthur Young, it was their power in Parliament and as local justices of the peace that enabled them to redistribute the land in their own favor. A typical round of enclosure began when several, or even a single, prominent landholder initiated it. In the great spurt of enclosures in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, this was done by petition to Parliament. A parliamentary commission would be set up to work out the details and engineer the appearance of local consensus. Since, as Manteau points out, the commissioners were invariably of the same class and outlook as the major landholders who had petitioned in the first place, it was not surprising that the great landholders awarded themselves the best land and the most of it, thereby making England a classic land of great well-kept estates with a small marginal peasantry and a large class of rural wage laborers. Those with only customary claim to use the land fell by the wayside, as did the marginal cottagers and squatters who had depended on the use of the wastes for their bare survival as partly independent peasants. In addition, better situated men often succumbed to the legal costs built into the enclosure process. The result was, in the words of J. L. and Barbara Hammond, that the enclosures created a new organization of classes. The peasants with rights and a status, with a share in the fortunes and government of his village, standing in rags but standing on his feet, makes way for the laborer with no corporate rights to defend, no corporate power to invoke, no property to cherish, no ambition to pursue, bent beneath the fear of his masters and the weight of a future without hope. No class in the world has so beaten and crouching a history. Footnote J. L. and Barbara Hammond, The Village Laborer, 1760-1832. New York, Harper, 1970-1911, page 81. So a parliament of large landowners set up commissions of large landowners to reform the agrarian sector of English society. Manteau comments that the abuse was so plain that the most determined supporters of the enclosures denounced it emphatically, Arthur Young among them. Footnote. Manteau, page 169. District by district, squatters, cottagers, and small farmers were driven out as self-supporting husbandmen, becoming a free-floating pool of rural labor or immigrating to America. Karl Marx and his successors have stressed the direct connection between the enclosures and the development of an industrial proletariat. Footnote. Marx, 1, page 717-749. Some writers, anxious to rebut the Marxist reading of the matter, have stressed the incremental nature of enclosure and the fairness under circumstances of the commissioners who oversaw the process. See J. D. Chambers, Enclosure and Labor Supply in the Industrial Revolution, Economic History Review, Second Series, 5, 1953, pages 319 to 343. H. J. Habakkuk, English Land Ownership, 1680 to 1740. Economic History Review, 10, February 1940, pages 2 to 17. W. E. Tate, Members of Parliament and Proceedings Upon Enclosure Bills, Economic History Review, 12, 1942, pages 68 to 75. To an American outsider, this necessarily seems like another exercise in convenient Whig history, without conceding the precise point the Marxists wish to make. When one of these writers, W. E. Tate, denies that the enclosures were unjust, except insofar as injustice must necessarily occur when one class legislates concerning the property and opportunities of another class, Barrington Moore Jr. comments that the reader may conclude that he has destroyed his own case. Footnote, Moore 22N. While enclosures did not instantly call into being an industrial reserve army, most authorities would agree that they did create a rural reserve army, many of whose descendants did ultimately become industrial workers or emigrants to the New World. Given the role of political power in the process of enclosure, it does not seem unfair to view enclosure as collectivization of agriculture for the benefit of a narrow class, whether or not it was the only way to increase agricultural efficiency, or whether it did increase it to the degree often supposed, are probably open questions. Falk Dovering writes that the enclosures depended primarily on the de facto power of the landlord class.
This naturally raises the question of whether or not England did not, at least in the agrarian sphere, follow a path closer to the Prussian road to capitalism than is usually believed. Footnote, Falk Dovering, The Transformation of European Agriculture, The Cambridge Economic History, edited by M. Poston and H. J. Habakkuk, London, CUP, 1966, 6.2, 628. 3. Land Monopoly and Latifundismo According to numerous authorities, Latin American poverty, unemployment, and productivity so low that agricultural countries actually import food are all rooted in latifundismo, or feudal land monopoly, dating from the Spanish and Portuguese conquest and settlement. Footnote. See Charles Gibson, Spain in America, New York, Harper, 1966. Ernest Fetter, The Rape of the Peasantry, Latin America's Landholding System. Garden City, New York, Anchor, 1971. Stanislav Andreski, Parasitism and Subversion, The Case of Latin America. London, Weidenfeld, 1969. And Irving Lewis Horowitz, Jose de Castro, and John Garassi, Editors, Latin American Radicalism, New York, Vintage, 1969. In most of these countries, the landed elites dominate the political structure. With its help, they exploit the peasants and maintain an agrarian reserve army of cheap and docile labor by quasi-feudal labor dues, fraud, inflation, which devours small savings, and ultimately armed violence by landlord-sponsored vigilantes or national armies. Footnote. Fetter, pages 3 to 45. André Gunder Frank makes a strong case that Latin American economies were capitalist from the very beginning. Capitalism and Underdevelopment in Latin America, New York, Monthly Review, 1969, pages 20 to 25. For a comparable reading of North American history, see Andrew Little, The Backwoods Progression, From Eden to Babylon, The Social and Political Essays of Andrew Nelson Little, edited by M. E. Bradford, Washington, D.C., Gateway Regnery, 1990, pages 77 to 94. Michael Merrill, Putting Capitalism in Its Place, A Review of Recent Literature. William and Mary Quarterly, 52, April 1995, pages 317 to 326. According to Ernst Fetter, the concentration of good land in the hands of a very small minority creates gross insufficiency, waste, mismanagement, and low productivity on Latin America's latifundia. Forcefully shut off from the market mechanism, the peasants respond by displaying self-hatred and unambitious behavior, which is then taken to prove their inherent stupidity. Footnote, Fetter, page 148. On forceful exclusion from markets, see, for example, Carol A. Smith, Local History and Global Context, Social and Economic Transitions in Western Guatemala. Comparative Studies in Society and History 26, 1984, pages 193 to 228. John Lai, The Concept of Mode of Exchange, American Sociological Review, 57, August 1992, pages 508 to 523. Built-in disincentives discourage the peasants, who gain nothing from harder work. Far from reflecting economies of scale arrived at in free markets, the politically-based latifundia are so overexpanded that often as much as one-third of the workforce is required to boss the other demoralized two-thirds. Hence, the great estates resemble nothing so much as islands of socialist calculational chaos, unable to operate at optimum economic rationality. Footnote on the problem of rational calculation, see Murray and Rothbard, Man, Economy, and State with Power and Market, Second Scholars Edition, Auburn, Alabama, Mises, 2009, pages 614 to 616 and 659 to 661. On Rothbard's analysis, any forcibly maintained monopoly represents a step in the direction of socialism, with the calculational difficulties pointed out in the 1920s by Ludwig von Mises and Max Weber. In contrast, Fetter argues that poor people are actually capable of great economic rationality and capital accumulation. To the extent that a small sector of family farms exists in Latin America, it is here that one finds land-intensive and productive farming as opposed to the better-capitalized estate sector.
Given the economic irrationality of the quasi-feudal sector and the destitution of peasants who could be productive, Fetter supports land reform both on the grounds of simple justice and economic progress. Like Fetter, the sociologist Stanislav Andreski takes a critical view of the chief structural realities of Latin American society. He believes that most of the problems in those countries stem from an inherited pattern of political parasitism. Interestingly, Andreski derives his conception of parasitism from the Traité de Législation, 1826, the major work of the French sociologist Charles Comte, whose importance as a classical liberal theorist is only now coming to be appreciated. Footnote on Charles Comte and his colleague Charles Dunoyer, see Leonard Ligio, Charles Dunoyer, and French Classical Liberalism, Journal of Libertarian Studies 1, Summer 1977, pages 153 to 178. Parasitism, by severing work from reward, is a necessarily strong barrier to social progress. An important form of parasitism is land monopoly, which restricts production and impoverishes the masses. On this matter, Andreski differs little from Fetter. Direct political appropriations of wealth by Latin American police, customs inspectors, and the like is enormous, according to Andreski. Although conditions vary from country to country, high tariffs, state loans, the licensing and bribery syndrome— government contracts, and even tax farming in Peru contribute to the popular view that all governments are merely bands of thieves. In Mexico, where state intervention is most extensive, payoffs are naturally highest. Everywhere, taxation falls mainly on the poorer classes. Militarism likewise wastes needed resources. Conscription exists in Latin America mainly to justify the bloated officer corps. Since Latin American armies are too large for internal policing and too small for serious foreign adventures, they really are huge bureaucracies which often intervene directly in politics. Their normal care plus what they rake off while running a country make their upkeep the most important form of parasitism in Latin America. Footnote, Andreski, pages 1 to 22. Latin America is cursed with a parasitic involution of capitalism, which Andreski defines as the tendency to seek profits and alter market conditions by political means in the widest sense. As a result, the continent suffers from hypertrophy of bureaucracy. Parasitic appropriation of wealth, constricted markets, the result of land monopoly and peasant poverty, uneconomic welfare legislation to buy off the urban poor, and rapid inflation make for permanent economic stagnation. This in turn fosters a permanent political instability. Andreski's general conclusion is that in Latin America, the superimposition of liberal constitutions in seigneurial, feudal economies has led to constitutional oligarchy or outright repression. Footnote, Andreski, page 77, 90, and 138. For the human cost of keeping entrenched elites in power in Latin America, see Penny Lerneau, Cry of the People, Garden City, New York, Doubleday, 1980. In Latin America, as in other parts of the world, the underlying importance of the land question and its increasing urgency make its resolution perhaps one of the more important items in the world agenda. Footnote, Falk Dovering, Land Reform, A Key to Change in Agriculture, Agricultural Policy in Developing Countries, edited by Nurul Islam, New York, Wiley, 1974, page 509 to 521. 4. Soviet Collectivization, A Bureaucratic Enclosure Movement. In pre-industrial Eastern Europe, the role of politics in the economic life of nations had always been apparent. There, the politically powerful landed elites created enormous latifundia in recent times, as David Mitrani put it. Footnote, David Mitrani, Marx Against the Peasant, A Study in Social Dogmatism, New York, Collier, 1961, page 77. To capitalize on new markets for cereals in the West, the lords dispossessed the peasants, retaining them as cheap labor. When World War I broke up the political power of the landed ruling class, the peasant masses rose up everywhere, with the exception of Hungary, and divided the great estates. 
Unable to do much else, the liberal semi-parliamentary successor regimes in these countries conceded the land seized by the peasants in the post-war period. This revolutionary breakthrough continued the process begun in the French Revolution. The situation in Russia was more complex. There, the serfs had been legally emancipated in the 1860s in a reform from above reminiscent of the Prussian experience in the Napoleonic era. Legally free, Russian peasants found themselves with inadequate amounts of land, the bulk of the land having been retained by the lords, and stiff commutation payments against their land. Footnote. See A. Gershenkron, Agrarian Policies and Industrialization, Russia, 1861 to 1917, in Poston and Habakkuk, page 706 to 800. Gershenkron notes that the smallness of plots plus the commutation fees imposed on the peasants kept them from becoming a significant internal market for Russian manufacturers, page 743. This unsatisfactory situation somewhat paralleled emancipation in the United States, where in the absence of land reform, the ex-slaves fell into the semi-slavery of sharecropping and peonage in the former Confederate states. Footnote, see Eric Foner, Nothing But Freedom, Emancipation and Its Legacy, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Louisiana State University Press, 1983. And on the persistence of the problem, Leo McGee and Robert Boone, editors, The Black Rural Landowner, Endangered Species, Westport, Connecticut, Greenwood, 1979. Thus, when the strains of World War I broke the power and prestige of Russia's czarist regime, discontented peasants supplied a mass base for radical revolution. In what would become a common pattern in the 20th century, land-hungry peasants provided the backbone of a revolution whose leaders, as Marxist and Leninists, had a somewhat different agenda than did the peasantry. Certainly, the Bolshevik leaders of the Russian Revolution were not inclined to let the goals of the struggle be set by the peasants. For decades, socialists had regarded peasants as retrograde individualists and natural enemies of the kinds of centralized direction that socialism demanded. Footnote. This is the theme of Mitt Rainey, pages 19 to 104. Like the petty bourgeoisie and the lumpen proletariat, the peasants were the likely source of renewed private accumulation of capital, and therefore, in the rather oversimplified model of base superstructure, the likely source of reactionary, anti-socialist political activity. The first socialist revolution had taken place in a country with an undeveloped proletariat, Having placed themselves at the head of a largely peasant-based revolution, Lenin and his vanguardists faced the very serious problem of how to hold on to power in a country where they and their supposed natural constituency, the industrial working class, were in a decided minority. Footnote. C.P. V.I. Lenin. Can the Bolsheviks Retain State Power? Selected Works. New York International, 1971. Pages 362-400. to Lenin characteristically masks his genuine unease with his usual rhetorical overkill. War communism, the attempt in the midst of civil war to leap into socialism by abolishing money and markets, had necessarily proved disastrous. To bring the Russian economy back to life as well as to conciliate a peasantry restive under forced levies and pro-urban exchange ratios, Lenin announced his strategic retreat from socialism, the New Economic Policy, NEP. Soon Lenin himself was writing of the need for freedom of trade and small-scale enterprise and cooperatives as intermediate steps in the path to socialism. He began to worry about dragging Russians out of Asiatic inefficiency and preventing the revival of stifling czarist bureaucracies. Footnote. For example, V. I. Lenin, On Cooperation, Works, page 690-699. to For differing views of Lenin and Lenin's NEP, see Stefan Halbrook, Lenin's Bakuninism, International Review of History and Political Science 8, February 1971, pages 89 to 111. Alec Nove, Lenin and the New Economic Policy, Lenin and Leninism, State Law and Society, edited by Bernard W. Eisenstadt, London, Lexington, 1971, pages 155 to 171, and V. N. Bandera, 
the New Economic Policy, NEP, as an Economic System, Journal of Political Economy 71, 1963, page 265 to 279. Of the three major contenders to party leadership after Lenin's death, Trotsky, Stalin, and Bukharin, it was Bukharin who emerged as the strongest proponent of continuing and extending the NEP free market and pursuing what he called the Worker-Peasant Alliance. Trotsky clung fiercely to the rigid Marxist program of creating heavy industry overnight on the backs of peasants. Stalin held the middle ground and waited to seize power. In this fluid period before Stalin's consolidation of power, significant debates took place over economic policy which had radical implications for the fate of the peasant majority. Footnote. See Alexander Ehrlich, The Soviet Industrialization Debate, 1924-1928, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press, 1960, for a summary of the discussion. On the right, as we are apparently obliged to call it, Bukharin, Rykov, Tomsky, the Institute of Red Professors, and the economist at Narkomfin, the state financial ministry, proposed to continue the NEP. Some at Narkomfin even toyed with bringing back some kind of gold standard. The Bukharinists found themselves advocating a program that in other contexts might have been called peasantist or even Jeffersonian. Footnote. On peasantist programs versus pro-industrial neo-mercantilist programs in Eastern Europe between the World Wars, see Mitt Rainey, pages 115 to 131. See also Alan Carlson, Third Ways, Wilmington, Delaware, ISI 2007, Chapter 4, Green Rising. They saw peasant demand as the key to Soviet economic development. In the context of the NEP free market, the rebuilding of the rural economy would go hand-in-hand hand with the development of light industries and consumer goods, with heavy industry developing as needed by the first two sectors. Like Lenin, Bukharin had come to fear the rise of a bureaucratic new class of former workers, which would arrogate total control of society to itself. As far back as 1916, he had written of the danger of the state in general. Footnote N. Bukharin, The Imperialist Pirate State, The Bolsheviks and the World War, edited by O. H. Genkin and H. H. Fisher, Stanford, California, Stanford University Press, 1940, pages 236 to 239. Now he was calling for allowing the peasants to enrich themselves as the starting point of Soviet development. His whole program was intended to avoid the level of bureaucratism implied in the program of the left, especially Trotsky and Prio Brzezinski. Isaac Deutscher calls Bukharin a Bolshevik bastiat who extolled Le Harmonie Economique of Soviet society under NEP and prayed that nothing should disturb those harmonies. Footnote. Isaac Deutscher, The Prophet Unarmed, Trotsky, 1921-1929, New York, Vintage, 1959, pages 223-234. to For more on Bukharin's views, see Alec Nove, Political Economy and Soviet Socialism, London, Allen, 1979, pages 81-99. to Nikolai Bukharin, Notes of an Economist, The Problem of Planning, Khrushchev and Stalin's Ghost, Text, Background, and Meaning of Khrushchev's Secret Report to the 20th Congress on the Night of February 24th to 25th, 1956, edited by Bertram D. Wolfe, New York, Prager, 1957, pages 295 to 315. Nikolai Bukharin, Organized Mismanagement in Modern Society. Essential Works of Socialism, edited by Irving Howe, New York, Bantam, 1971, page 190-194. On the left, again an obligatory term, Trotsky, Priobrzezinski, and their ilk called for primitive socialist accumulation of capital to repeat the growth of early capitalism as set forth by Marx in Capital. They wanted to recreate this supposedly necessary stage of economic history under the aegis of the Bolshevik state and telescope the process into a few generations. As some wit has said, Trotsky wanted two stages of history for the price of one. 
they faced the implication that they would have to exploit the peasant majority to extract an economic surplus with which to build heavy industry, which to them was the essence of development, and would, incidentally, enlarge the proletariat, their supposed political base. Since they were Marxists, such exploitation was morally neutral, a tool in the building of socialism, and not at all the private exploitation of the bad old days. State control of agricultural prices would favor urban areas and heavy industry and build a modern economy as rapidly as possible. If the peasants didn't like the new arrangements, they would be forced to. Trotsky had never shied away from using force. Footnote on such socialist exploitation, see Deutscher, pages 43 to 46, 234 to 238, and 415 to 416. Unfortunately for both sides, Stalin gradually eased himself into control of the party and state and purged them all. Once firmly in control, he adopted most of the left's economic program, sending cadres of armed party members into the countryside to divide the peasants and push them into collective farms, as called for by ideology and interest. With all kinds of violence and dislocation necessary, the prosperous peasants, the kulaks, were eliminated as a class, many of them physically. Footnote, C. M. Lewin, Russian Peasants and the Soviet Power. New York, W. W. Norton, 1975, and Robert Conquest, The Harvest of Sorrow, New York, O. U. P., 1986. With their much-feared leaders eliminated by the Stalinist terror, the peasants had little choice but to acquiesce in this bureaucratic enclosure movement. Only after Stalin's death could any debate on the direction of Soviet economic policy, however mild, reemerge. Footnote for a rather tepid debate, see the account in Sidney Ploss, Conflict and Decision-Making in Soviet Russia, A Case Study of Agricultural Policy, 1953-1963, Princeton, New Jersey, Princeton University Press, 1965. The Soviet state itself had become the new landlord. It seems clear enough that the right program was viable. Footnote for an interesting defense of Bukharinism, see Micah Gisser and Paul Jonas, Soviet Growth in the Absence of Centralized Planning, a Hypothetical Alternative, Journal of Political Economy, 82, March to April, 1974, pages 333 to 347, in which the authors allow that industrialization could have taken place at the same rate, or even a more impressive rate, without the preo brzezinski stalin policies, which led to unnecessary sufferings on the part of the Soviet population and misallocation of resources, page 348. Their argument, unfortunately, is subject to the general methodological stricture that econometric models may not actually mean a great deal. For an endorsement of agriculture plus light industry, see John Kenneth Galbraith, Ideology and Agriculture, Harper's, February 1985, pages 15 to 16. Certainly, it did not entail the level of violence, death, and economic destruction required to carry through the Trotsky-Stalin model. But just as in the case of the English enclosures, political power decided the event, not necessarily in the interests of the peasants, short or long run. Perhaps the two cases, though they differ considerably, will shed light on some persistent fallacies concerning peasants, agriculture, and development. 5. Conclusion Mercantilism and Applied German Idealism versus Peasantries, Markets, and Balanced Development the political success of the large estate system in England led many observers wrongly to conclude that large-scale agricultural enterprise was inherently efficient and progressive. Conversely, small-scale family-operated peasant farms came to be viewed as uneconomic, backward, reactionary obstacles to progress. Despite the obvious spectacular success of small farms in the non-slaveholding portions of the 19th century United States, the model that Bukharin came to embrace and extol, a curious alliance of Tories and technocrats, including the Marxists, asked nothing so much from progress as that peasants be swept away by large-scale enterprise, whether private or collectivist. Edward Gibbon Wakefield, for example, urged that the distribution of land in Britain's colonies be handled in such a way as to reproduce the class structure and concentration of capital characteristic of the mother country. Footnote, Bernard Semmel, 
The Philosophic Radicals and Colonialism, Journal of Economic History 21, December 1961, pages 513 to 525. Marx, while critical of Wakefield as a bourgeois thinker, offered little or no quarter to small-scale farming, since as a form of simple commodity production it was doomed to succumb first to bourgeois concentration of property, then to socialist organization of agricultural battalions. Footnote. Marx 1, pages 765 to 774. Marx ignores the implications of his own argument. Strangely, he did seem to use the income which once went to small direct producers as an implicit measure of exploitation and surplus value. Footnote. Marx 1, part 7. It is perhaps unfortunate that the English experience became the basis of so much theorizing on economic growth. As Falk Dovering writes, A principal origin of the myth of the large farm is clearly in the victory of the estate system in England through the enclosure movement from the 16th to the early 19th centuries. How mythical the beneficence of the English large estate was has become clear from research showing how little agricultural progress really was achieved in the 18th century. Since the early socialists accepted the economic rationale of large-scale agricultural enterprise put forward by the defenders of Britain's landed elite, it is not surprising that they were hostile from the beginning to peasant aspirations. To quote Dovering again, The parallel strands of ideology from English aristocracy and Marxist socialism have done much over the years to discredit small-scale peasant farming despite its success in Europe and Asia. Footnote Dovering, 520, both quotations. This mesalliance still has much influence on the economic policies of the post-colonial Third World, where many governments prefer tax-intensive super-projects of capital investment in heavy industry, for example steel mills, nuclear power plants, in countries that barely feed themselves. Some economists are beginning to question this preferred model of development and are suggesting that the Jeffersonian slash peasantist slash Bukharinist program of letting small scale farmers take the lead is the soundest path in agrarian societies with an abundance of labor and a shortage of everything else. Thus, John Kenneth Galbraith writes that socialism does not easily preempt the self-motivated farm proprietor and urges the undeveloped countries to allow agricultural prices to rise to their natural level to stimulate production rather than subsidizing city dwellers at the expense of farmers. Footnote, Galbraith, 16. Economist Sudha Shanoi argues that to achieve a working, integrated capital structure, third-world governments should not pour investment into higher-order goods for heavy industry, but should start where their economies are. In these areas, the kinds of investment that would raise final output are more in the agricultural sector. Footnote, Sudha Shanoi, Two Applications of Hayekian Capital Theory, Unpublished Paper, No Date, Page 3. In fairness, it should be noted that the late Dr. Shinoy took a radically different view of enclosures than the one proposed here. P.T. Bauer, longtime critic of third world policies, says, It is a crude error to equate capital formation with specific types of heavy industry. Footnote P.T. Bauer, Planning and Development, Ideology and Realities, Unpublished Paper, No Date, Page 7. Dovering observes that on the basis of family farming, a future, more broadly based cadre of business entrepreneurs tends to emerge. Footnote, Dovering, page 519. The belief in the superior efficiency of large-scale units as such, and in all markets at all times, extends far beyond the discussion on agriculture. Here, too, we can spy the same underlying ideological alliance of Marxists and the conservative and post-classical liberal thinkers, who may best be understood as corporatists. Footnote. On corporatism, see R. Jeffrey Lustig, Corporate Liberalism, The Origins of Modern American Political Economy, 1890-1920. Berkeley, California, University of California Press, 1982. 
Noting the identity between the economic views of conservative corporatists like Theodore Roosevelt and the Marxists as regards economic concentration, Walter Karp writes that the political distortions engendered by class analysis are well illustrated in a common ideological treatment of America's small farmers. Since they, like small businessmen, were anti-monopoly, they have often been categorized as capitalists. One result of this is that the great populist revolt against the party machines is often described as essentially conservative. This is because small capitalists, by ideological definition, are in the backwash of history trying to hold back social change, a mealy-mouthed way of saying that the oligarchs were trying to get rid of them. Mutatis mutandis. The same things could be said of the English yeomen or the Russian kulaks. According to Tories, neo-mercantilists, and Marxists, peasants and the petty bourgeois are doomed to be overrun by the locomotive of history, whether in the name of efficiency, progress, or socialism. To quote Karp once more, ideological categories always describe as natural, inevitable, or inherent what the wielders of corrupt power are actively trying to accomplish. Footnote, Walter Karp, Indispensable Enemies, The Politics of Misrule in America. Baltimore, Penguin, 1974, page 179, both quotes. The obvious question is, were other outcomes conceivable for England or Russia? A. Counterfactual England. The English Civil War of the 1640s provided perhaps the best opportunity for a measure of agrarian reform. For better or for worse, the revolution remained under the control of the men around Cromwell, who were little disposed to unleash the forces that might destroy them. Even the levelers, who were radical libertarians and not primitive socialists, largely shied away from raising any agrarian questions, although some effort was made to obtain freeholder status for copyholders. Footnote C. B. McPherson, The Political Theory of Possessive Individualism, Hobbes to Locke, London, OUP, 1962, pages 107 to 591. At the height of the enclosures, one or two critics suggested alternative paths. We have already seen that Arthur Young, once an impatient advocate of enclosure, came to criticize the process. Among the most interesting proposals were those of the Reverend David Davies, who wrote The Case of Laborers in Husbandry, 1795. Davies sought to get something for the small man out of the process of agrarian change. Allow the cottager a little land about his dwelling for keeping a cow, for planting potatoes, for raising flax or hemp. Secondly, convert the wastelands of the kingdom into small arable farms, a certain quantity every year, to be let on favorable terms to industrious families. Thirdly, restrain the engrossment and over-enlargement of farms. Footnote, quoted from Hammond and Hammond, page 58. Such proposals, had they been implemented, might have slightly lessened the pace of industrialization while making the transition easier for cottagers and other poor farmers. Plans for agrarian reform became part of the English radical tradition, from Payne and Shelley through Corbett down to G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc, among others. As things actually happened, land-hungry Britons had to remove to North America and undertake their political and agrarian revolutions there. Especially if we take the Homestead Acts as an attempt at land reform in advance, despite its ultimate failure. But even the efficiency argument for the enclosures may not be conclusive. Writing of the continental experience, Dovering says, The allegation often made that land consolidation is a prerequisite of the use of modern crop rotations has not been borne out by experience, whatever damage fragmentation has done to the technical and economic efficiency of labor and capital. Footnote, Dovering, page 631. For migration out of the British Isles, see again Balin, pages 43 to 49, 291, 375 to 376, and 606 to 608. Hence, a course of modernization more like that of France, though one could hope with less bureaucracy, would not have been impossible for England. Newer writing on enclosure strongly suggests reopening the whole debate. Footnote, 
See, for example, Jeffrey W. Bentley, Economic and Ecological Approaches to Land Fragmentation in Defense of a Much Maligned Phenomenon. Annual Review of Anthropology, 1967, pages 31 to 67. John Seville, Primitive Accumulation and Early Industrialization in Britain. Socialist Register, London, Merlin, 1969, pages 247 to 271. William Lazonic, Karl Marx and Enclosures in England, Review of Radical Political Economics, 6, 1974, pages 1 to 59. E. Thompson, Customs in Common, London, Penguin, 1993. R. C. Allen, Enclosure and the Yeoman, Oxford, Clarendon OUP, 1992. M. E. Turner, Enclosures in Britain, 1750 to 1830, Second Edition, London, Macmillan, 1984, and J. M. Neeson, Commoners, Common Rights, Enclosure and Social Change in England, 1700 to 1820, Cambridge, C. U. P. 1993. B. A Counterfactual Russia. Only a few diehards would now defend the course of Soviet collectivization under Stalin. Even so, a great many economists and historians remain enamored of the notion that something like it was necessary to industrialize and modernize a backward peasant society. In the face of the growing critique of the centralized model of development, this position no longer seems tenable. The emergence in the 1960s of market socialism and subsequent reforms from the 1970s onward in Eastern Europe and later China seemed partial vindications of Bukharin and foretold the eventual decision of purely economic issues in favor of the right deviationists of the 1920s. Footnote See Vladimir's Bruce, The Market in a Socialist Economy, London, Routledge, 1972. Gary North, The Crisis in Soviet Economic Planning, Modern Age 14, Winter 1969 to 1970, pages 49 to 56. Gregory Grossman, editor, Value and Plan: Economic Calculation and Organization in Eastern Europe, Berkeley, California, University of California Press, 1960. V. V. Kusin, editor, The Czechoslovak Reform Movement, Oxford, OUP, 1973. Radislav Seluki, Economic Reforms in Eastern Europe, New York, Prager, 1972. Strangely, Stefan Cohen's Bukharinism and the Bolshevik Revolution, New York, Knopf, 1973, underestimates the value of Bukharin's economic program. A turn toward markets became inevitable, even if in practice internal gangsters and outside imperialists, NATO, reaped most of the gains. Unfortunately for Soviet society in the 1920s, sheer lack of experience with non-centralized economic management and Stalin's ability to seize the already dangerous political machinery created by Lenin combined to prevent a reasonable reform of Russia's agrarian economy. As with the enclosures, political power proved decisive, although other outcomes would not have been impossible in principle. Afterward on Enclosures, 2011 Accumulating evidence would seem to suggest new approaches to modern history. Instead of a simple transition from feudalism to capitalism, we actually find considerable continuity between these supposedly opposed systems, and along with that continuity, cumulative change yielding capitalism as we know it. Mercantilism and merchant capitalism flowed from the new forms of society and state, which conserved feudal land monopoly and certain feudal attributes and behaviors, while creating new commercial openings by which well-connected merchant adventurers and large landholders could profit from controlled trade, especially in overseas empires. Footnote. In addition to Mayer, Krishan Kumar, Pre-Capitalist and Non-Capitalist Factors in the Development of Capitalism, Fred Hirsch and Joseph Schumpeter, Dilemmas of Liberal Democracies, edited by Adrian Ellis and Krishan Kumar, London, Tavistock, 1983, pages 151 to 166. Thus, alongside Moore's Three Roads Away from Feudalism, where feudal absolutism is actually meant, the Anglo-American democratic, the Prussian, revolution from above, as in Germany and Japan, and finally, mass-based peasant revolution followed by communist rule, there perhaps existed another route hinted at by Eric Hobswam, the peasant road to capitalism, partially realized in North America, if only for a season. 
Footnote. More. Hopswam. Scottish Reformers. Page 21. We may quarrel with Hopswam's choice of the word capitalism here. Along with the new literature on enclosures, referred to earlier, this reorientation threatens to undermine received Whiggish analyses of modern history in a way that should reinforce inquiry into small commodity production as a potentially distinct mode of production and an alternate way of life. Footnote. Jeff Kennedy. Digger Radicalism and Agrarian Capitalism. Historical Materialism 14, 2006, pages 113 to 143 maintains that even the supposedly pro-communist Gerard Whitstanley was mainly interested in preventing the spread of wage labor where it did not already exist in favor of small-scale production. The bottom line seems to be this. In 1500, England had a large peasantry, but by 1820, that class had virtually disappeared. Fear of conceding anything to Marx, who, after all, must occasionally be right, has blocked the vision of classical liberals investigating this disappearance. But 300 years of English agrarian history cannot easily squeeze themselves into a Whig story in which the forces of production demanded new relations of production, which done, everyone lived happily ever after, full stop. It might be added that improving landlords had many levers, and not just enclosure, with which to rid themselves of unwanted peasants. They did, however, improve their rent rolls. Referring to the pre-enclosure organization of English farming, Michael Turner writes, If in so many ways the gains from enclosure are in doubt, yet the damage is plain to see, then we must ask ourselves, if it wasn't broken, why did we fix it? Footnote, Michael Turner, Enclosures Reopened, Refresh 26, Spring 1998, page 4. The question is best addressed to those classes that desired and brought about the new order of agrarian capitalism.